Showcasing local talent, professionals, and everyday people making Salt Lake City what it is today. It's time for another episode of the I Am Salt Lake podcast. All right, let's welcome everybody out today to episode 323 of I Am Salt Lake podcast. My name's Chris. And my name's Chrissy. Hey, this episode of the podcast is proudly sponsored by our friends at Five Wise Vodka, Mountain Standard Time Marketing, and Market Source Real Estate. We're going to tell you more about these awesome local businesses and why you need to be supporting them. We're going to tell you more about them later on in the podcast. On this episode of the podcast, we get the chance to catch up with Kristen B. Hodson. She was on episode 95, which was crazy because that was like five years ago and so much has happened in both of our lives. So it was great to bring her back, catch up with her. Plus this time around, Chrissy got to be here because the first time you were not co-hosting the podcast with me, Chrissy. No. And listening to 95 as a listener, I had so many questions and so much I wanted to jump in on. So this was really fun to be able to follow up with someone who I had listened to you interview before. And this, I mean, the podcast has come so far anyway. I yeah, mean, just yeah. me as a person, I've chatted with more people. I knew how to carry a conversation better, the equipment, the quality. I mean, this was a really fun episode. Uh, for those of you that don't know who Kristen is, she is the founder and executive director of The Healing Group. I'm actually going to read her bio that's on The Healing Group website. I think it sums up nicely on, on what she is and what she's about. So she practices as a psychotherapist with a passion helping women find their authentic self by working through areas where they feel stuck. She believes in empowering women to, uh, to own and take charge of their growth in healing. She does this by working besides them in a collaborative and professional way, offering reflective insight, expertise, experience, and expertise. Clients often say they feel supported and safe to express and explore thoughts, emotions, and vulnerabilities, bringing about new understanding, fulfilling changes, and personal joy. She is a mother and wife and lives life passionately out loud. And actually reading that, it's so true. That's exactly the sense I got from talking to Kristen. And that's why I wanted to read the bio. I know Mm -hmm. it's kind of generic, right? Like we could have gave some crazy insight on her. And I don't want to, I, I hate... With these intros, I don't like to give away too much of the podcast. It's like, yeah, you got to listen to this conversation. And this this uh, conversation with Kristen is like every other one. You got to listen to it. Get to know Kristen. Uh, we're going to put all the links at IamSaltLake.com. And uh, that's our website. If you've never been to IamSaltLake.com, like say this is your first time listening, head on over to the website. That's where all the episodes are. There's also all the links to subscribe right there. You could subscribe to our email list. You can connect with us. Everything is at IamSaltLake.com. Go check it out. And with all that being said, let's jump into that conversation with Kristen B. Hodson when she came over to our office to share her story. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy. So you were actually on the podcast very first time, August 25th, 2013. That's wild. Which was actually the one year anniversary of the podcast. This August, upcoming August, will be the six year anniversary Mm -hmm. of the podcast. So five years ago, you were on the podcast. I actually re-listened to that episode this morning while I was at the gym. I was 35 years old. We were recording in a very small apartment. I want to jump into a a little deeper with you. And I think at that time I was telling you before we we hit record, we're recording here, by the way, your voice is perfect right there. I was very uncomfortable. I think a lot of it, I was new to podcasting. I didn't know how deep to get, how open to get. Now I think how it's a little bit- How much sex to talk about. How much sex to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I feel, to, 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 be honest, <laughs> to be honest with you, I think a lot of it was I feel like even now I know you better, Kristen. Absolutely. And I think before it was like, gosh, I don't want to get awkward here. I don't want or you to think I was hitting on you or something, right? <laughs> uh-huh. Like, Well, it's and, kind of an awkward thing. Like if you're in a small space with just one other person and then you're talking about something so, you know, maybe not everyone's super comfortable with. Mm-hmm. It's just like, oh, how does that person feel? I want them to be comfortable. Right. So then you're uncomfortable and well, I think spirals. I think it, I'm going to be honest too. I think a lot of it has to do with Utah. Even oh, though yeah. Even though I'm not of the, you know, the dominant religion here, I'm still very... 
uh, I think I still have a lot of that sex where you're made to believe you shouldn't even really talk about sex. Well, and I, I have a dear colleague that talks about that even if you're not of the dominant religion, if you're not in the Bible Belt or the Mormon Belt or these other religious belts, you still swim in the same soup. You're still governed by laws that are I mean, we're abstinence plus state. Yeah. You're still in a state where most people refer to sex in the euphemism of intimacy. Like you're still swimming in it. So you yeah. pick up on it. I think, you know, it's interesting. So when you were on the podcast, originally I was, I was single at the time I was dating and, uh, you know, obviously now I'm married, but when I was dating, even, even sex, it's not really talked about. You don't really talk about things. I was no. actually very surprised of it. There wasn't a lot mm-hmm. of discussion of, of things. Not, I, I don't know what those things even well, would be. I don't even know, like, if it's a, more of a generational thing and we're starting to just open up as a, as a people or if it's more of a conservative thing where there's just a lot of shame, you know? Yes. You're, you're scared to talk about things because you're afraid of being judged or, you know, if, if you're thinking differently than other people, there is a heavy amount of guilt and shame Absolutely. associated with it. Mm-hmm. So that, yeah, I think I mean, it can be a both and that we have the generation generations deep where it wasn't talked about. Yeah. And so none of it's modeled. Most people are having sex long before they ever talk about it ever. Oh yeah. Um, and that's and what you do to stop talking, stop that's the right. talking, <laughs> but I think kids are talking to each other about it all the time, not only just verbally, mm. but through texting, sexting, swiping, rights, so all this it's happening. They're just not talking to the adults. Well, and it's yeah. a lot easier to get it nowadays. Again, when I was single, you mean you had Tinder, you had, uh, what other dating apps were Bumble, there? Bumble maybe? Bumble. I don't know. Well, Bumble Match. wasn't com. out yet, but, uh, yeah, anyway. Match.com would have been a biggie back then. People are just accessible. Yeah. You know, they're more it's accessible a lot, It's a lot were. easier to get a, a date. Uh, at two in the morning, if you want. I was just going to say, preference, <laughs> the type of person, the timing, yeah. when you want to go, it's all the time. So five years ago, and what, what's, what's been going on, Kristen? Oh. What's, where do we start with you? I mean, I, I feel like we should jump somewhere with you, right? Uh, yeah. You're, you're still doing the healing group. Mm-hmm. That's exploded, though, a little bit bigger. So what's than- happened is the, the healing group has exploded. We opened up our second location in Park City. We're opening up Utah County um, in May. So that's been good, but... The biggest addition was adding sexual health to our clinic and making that a big part of our work. Um, I started teaching about that same time, uh, sexual, like a sex class up at the U in the master's program and doing a lot of public advocacy work. And I do a lot more media and outreach to try to make this a, a conversation that could be had in our community, within families, within relationships, all of it. And so I feel like a lot of my self-development has happened. I, I wrote the book about the same time too. And it's wild when you publish a book because it's almost like the moment you hit publish or you it goes to the publisher, there's things you already need to update. Oh, yeah. So five years in the realm of sexual health feels ancient to me. When textbooks, they're being updated every year because it's changing so rapidly. So my voice in my book five years ago, there's still a lot of very relevant stuff. And pieces that really, really need to be updated. So are you writing a new book by chance? We have the publisher. We just need to send the updates. Um, being a mom of three, running a business, <laughs> and doing media and all this. It what? takes a little you bit can't of time. Have it all. You can have it all, clearly. You I don't know not. how you do it. Oh, my gosh. Do you I even just, want it all? Really? I, well, right now, I'm like, I don't think I do. Because I, yeah. I started work at eight today. And then um, did clients, then went to soccer, then coming to podcasts. Yeah. I mean, that's, is, that, is that a typical day for you, though? I would like say it is. starting early in the morning and then not. I do my, I, st- I wake up every day at 5 a.m. to get two hours of work in before my kids wake oh, up. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So, and that's what that's I do. That's incredible. Um, that's what you have to do. I mean, there, I've really learned since I moved into a house with kids, <laughs> I, I've learned to really cherish that mm-hmm. time in the morning. That yep. quiet time. And I didn't do it before. I didn't understand parents that talked about it. I just didn't yeah. understand it. I had it's not even before. possible to understand until you're in that situation. Mm-mm. And then Mm-mm. you're like, oh, oh, back then when I said I had no free time, it was all free time <laughs> <laughs> my entire life. Yeah. And it, I call, I do a lot of work on mama standard time, which is before my kids wake up and when they go to bed. How old, oh, are, yeah. how old are your kids now? Uh, three, six. Well, she'll be seven. Three, seven, and nine. Oh, so they're at the. I mean, they're they're not at an easy stage either. 
No, and they're in super curious. We're having all sorts of conversations. Like my nine-year-old could flat out tell you right now what a period is, what's the point of it, why a woman bleeds every month. Like we're having really lots of people could see that they're robust conversations, but I love it. That's so love great. I, my daughter tries to have those conversations with me and I'm yeah. like, ah, uncomfortable. Why Don't though? It. Why is it know. uncomfortable for you though? You Chrissy? know, I, I don't know. I wish I did, but I, I think it's that whole, the whole like conservative shame that has been kind mm-hmm. of implemented me over years and years of just, you know, it develops up. over the lifespan. Like in the yeah. same time your sexuality is developing. So is your internalized shame. Yeah, exactly. See, mm-hmm. she said it better than me. Do you find that people over the last, so when we talked, I'm going to compare a lot to when we first talked, yeah. but do you find people are more open now versus five years ago to talk about sex and they're a little more progressive here in Utah? I feel like that that's happening in a major way because I think the article, there was an article recently published in the Tribune yesterday and it was a front page article on a sexual revolution happening in Utah. And I feel like five years ago, I feel like the the emails I would have gotten, because I did get some some emails uh, in regards to my work that I was taking people slowly to hell or, I, I mean, I've gotten all, and I didn't get one negative email yet. And, and I'll put wow. the link for this up at IamSaltLake.com with this episode uh, so, so people can check it out if they didn't. You actually messaged me. I think it might have even been today. Or was yeah, it yesterday? I think it was yesterday. And uh, I mean, it was just kind of a, a coincidence. I mean, how close these were together and how we were scheduled uh, to come and do the podcast. So, it, I mean, it's, it's cool. And, and what's cool about this, we've actually developed even our own relationship with Braxton. Mm-hmm. Braxton's been on, the, on this podcast. Uh, he does his own podcast. When are you going to do your own podcast? We talked about this too. I, mean, you <laughs> I know. The- I don't feel like therapists are very any entertaining podcasters. I've well, been no. I've I been a, to, because I, mean, I do the questions. I disagree. Typically. See, I think that's the fascinating thing, though, because you have this this perspective that the rest of us don't have because we're kind of in a like an emotion tunnel, mm-hmm. and you don't have that. You can actually share information. Well, I have been. Us. I've been a co-host of. It's called the Love You Mentry podcast with Nate Bagley. And I've been a co-host of that. And we've been doing it on the Today's Mama platform. So we've been recording it live Facebook, but then putting them over on iTunes and Stitcher. Okay, so you're doing this now? Yeah. Oh, and that's been been really That went over my head. I didn't even realize this. So where can listeners listen? If you go to the Love You Mentry, um, I think this is season three that Nate's been doing. And and we've been toying with what it's like to have me as a co-host. Not wow. him. Nate's been super supportive and like, you should do this. I'm like, I don't know. Because really, as a therapist, some people might believe that you're just, you're an advice giver. You're not. Yeah. Your your job as a therapist is to ask questions mm-hmm. that provoke uh, insight and emotion and sure. curiosity. So again, to be behind a microphone and fill up airtime, mm-hmm. that's kind of counter normally. Like I... Right here, my most place, the place of most comfort would be to ask you guys all these questions and get you to talk. <laughs> here you go. I mean, it could be therapy so, for Chrissy and I. But this is really oh, fun man. to be on this mic and be asked questions because normally the therapist, you don't. You so this finally is fun. get to have an opinion. Yeah, right? it's fun. It's really fun. I have a question right here. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to jump into it. We're going to jump all over the place. We'll, we'll refer to this, even this article, I'm sure a few more times. But like it says right here, you know, with abstinence policies in schools and groups declaring porn a health crisis, blah, blah, blah. Porn is, do you think porn is a health crisis in, in no, Utah? No, not when we're swimming in some of the most toxic air. It's absolutely not a health crisis. Why do you feel that it has made to believe that it is? Well, and I call it the big three. The biggest players that are speaking out on pornography and dictating legislation and education is you have the Utah State Legislature. You have the LDS Church. And I need to put a disclaimer that I identify as a Mormon. Yeah. So... Um, but I also challenge status quo and practices that are toxic and not good. So you have the the LDS church that right now is a some majority of conference talks have been on the dangers of pornography. And um, and then you have fight the new drug, which is huge in Utah. So you have those fight big the three. new drug. Oh, yeah. What's that? It is an organization that has really catered to the younger generation and made a cause around Porn, you, you, have you seen the shirts of P- Porn Kills Love? I'm sure. Yeah, oh, I'm pretty okay. sure. Okay. So, um, like any porn, just a little bit of porn. Well, that's the funny thing. I'm glad you say that, Chris, because <laughs> when we say the word bit. porn, we all assume we're talking about the same product and we're not. Like 
porn is just as broad of a term as the word sex. So, yeah. so what are we talking? And most people, like when I'm in session and I'll ask a wife, do you know what kind of porn he's looking at? And they're like, no, I actually haven't ever asked. I'm like, let's ask. And it is dramatically less than what they've come up with in their mind. And so when we're talking about porn, the first thing is, is we all assume we're talking about the exact same porn, like, mm-hmm. like, really like TV. Filthy There's, yes. dogs and all oh. that. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think people do, they, they, you go to the worst case scenario, especially if you don't understand it. And oftentimes religious communities, I don't know if you remember on Facebook, but pornography in the worst case scenario turns you into a serial killer like Ted Bundy. Because there's a two minute clip of Ted Bundy saying, oh, it was, I looked at pornography and this is what made me into a killer. The fascinating piece about this is Ted Bundy was getting all of his pornography from the neighbor's um, garbage cans down the street. And his neighbor's not a serial killer. Well, and, yeah, that's, and that's like saying yeah, everybody who drinks a beer is going to turn into a heroin addict, exactly. or an alcoholic yes. or drive drunk or, you know, right. you, some of us can control it. Mm-hmm. So do you think that looking at any porn is bad? Like what if Chrissy well, and I just want to look at a little porn Let's pull it apart together. a little bit because I do not think pornography is how kids, pornography is not age, well, let's say it's not age appropriate. Minors yeah. should not be looking at porn. Sex education should not be porn. But if you are um, an adult and you want to look at pornography. And, it, and as long as it, like, you know, you're still going to work, you, you have a, maybe a good marriage, you have a maybe. a. It depends on. So there's a really great David Lay talks about the ethical use of porn. When you start into getting into the ethics, because there's also a belief that everyone that's in the industry is being exploited. Mm-hmm. They're all there because and you have really smart, educated and people that choose to be there. Mm-hmm. that make a good living, that are very smart. And and there's the whole ethics around this. Are there, like amateur porn, you can get into realms of, you don't know how these people got there. And, but if you're, and that's a lot of times the accessible free porn. Mm-hmm. But if you're paying for your pornography, which I can sound weird, that can be an ethical way to consume your pornography. I've never thought about that before. There, there is an ethic to yeah. it. Huh. Um, you so it's also okay have, if you pay. See, I told you. There, oh, okay. There's, Good investment. And, and also, also, is it something that you are keeping secret if you are in a committed relationship? And the assumption is, is that all of our all of our sexuality is between us, and you're yeah. sneaking off. True. Can consider the ethics around that. It seems like at that point, porn isn't the problem. The problem is that you are keeping secrets and you're you're yes. technically having some kind of emotional affair but in again, some way. But again though it might not be the person's fault. It might be because they don't even know how to bring it up to their significant other. How right. do you bring yeah. it up that hey I like to look at some porn ones? I don't we don't yeah, you definitely got to But I, I guess the out. bigger the biggest thing of the takeaway cuz you could we could talk about this for hours yeah, yeah, but yeah. the yeah. biggest takeaway is that there's so much more to the porn conversation than the big headlines and the titles and and far more nuanced than porn is good or bad. In your yeah. opinion, just to just what would mean? What would make it so somebody like? How do you know if you're addicted to porn? What would be a porn addiction? So I don't even believe in porn addiction. Yeah, I mean, do I feel like people that because one of the there was research that actually came out of BYU that the higher you the the higher the religiosity like so if you identified more religious, the more likely you are to identify as a porn addict mm, because okay? you like it at all. Because, or, well, because you like sex, you, even. you can grow up in a system where you've had this internalized shame mm-hmm. and you've internalized these messages. So for you to look at pornography, if you look at the criteria for what makes a, a you a sex addict, pretty much everyone could be a sex addict because it's right. really, really um, objective. And like, do you look at pornography and you wish you could stop it? You keep doing it. Well, yeah. And even if you're doing that four times a year, the guilt can be off the charts Um, so that criteria, so I use more of the language of out of control sexual behavior because people really develop an unhealthy, toxic relationship with pornography. Uh, but if you look at it just from an addiction standpoint, or you're focusing on the behavior, you're often missing what's below it, which can be oftentimes sex is symptomatic, not the Mm -hmm. problem. So the mental, like there can be issues of narcissism, OCD, anxiety, depression, relational problems. Well, it's a trauma. great anxiety. <laughs> trauma. No, that's true. Uh, so, but I love that because we are not ever taught that if you know if you have this, there's really an underlying problem. Right. They're like, no, porn's the problem. Porn's the no, problem. No, alcohol's the problem. No, but it's really like 
you're forcing people to take a deeper look at themselves and say, why? What's going why on? Why are you doing this? Yeah. And that's and that's where I don't really want to minimize how much pornography can really disrupt a person's life. Mm-hmm. And by calling an out of control sexual behavior doesn't minimize how per, like how much this is impacting someone's life. And some people will think, oh, so if you don't think it's an addiction, are you pro porn? Or yeah. you're minimizing my issues. Not at all. Not at all. I just want to help you get to the root of what's going on so that we can solve it instead of focus on behavior. Like mm-hmm. it's not just that. So um, and, and so when you go to go back to the public health crisis, what I think is the public health crisis is we continue to be like porn is so terrible and we're not going to teach our kids anything about sex education and we're going to continue to be an abstinence plus state. That's a that's I'm still amazed. I'm amazed that that's even this day and age that that's an appropriate response, right. you know, th- right. that it's OK to just not teach kids. Just don't talk about it and it won't happen. Right. 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 What do I'm sure you deal with people out of state, right out of the city of Utah. What do they think of that? Have you, do well, they have any comments on on the whole porn crisis? Or they think it's fascinating because it's for a lot of people, it's not a thing. Yeah, it's not a thing. But they also don't grow up in as thick of a religious soup as Mm -hmm. we do so in fact i just had a woman message me from the uk that said you know i saw your article and over here we're teaching our kids comprehensive sex ed pretty much from the moment they're born and i'm teaching my kids the details of it um, and it's just not a big deal it's just a natural part of life like anything else Um, so i'm going to reach out and talk to her because out of the state they're shocked how pornography is such a big deal here Mm -hmm. but we're not looking at this other side we just keep taking taking away things putting on blinders and not looking at this from a bit more and then they teach abstinence only at school yeah which okay i'm gonna i I might come across a little i was homeschooled too so i don't know if i if i told you i mentioned that before i never went to public school okay Mm -hmm. Uh, i've talked about a little bit here on the podcast so obviously my mom tried to teach me about sex. She did a horrible job of it. I'm going to admit it. I mean, but I think most parents do. I don't sure. think, I don't know if that's a parent's place. I'm going to say it. You know what? The research shows that most kids want their parents to talk to them about sex. Really? And they want to be able to turn to their parents. It, I don't know. It I only mean, becomes taboo because the parents are often awkward about it. Is that and what so it the is? parents yeah. are like, Ooh. I think, I think on Braxton's episode, I talked about the talk with my daughter. Mm-hmm. I, I remember her. that. Oh, yeah. Yep, I remember that. Oh, when we like, had Braxton on yeah, the podcast. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. like, and I just, I think I most of us as parents, we don't know what to do. We don't know, you know, what, a, because we never learned what a healthy discussion was for ourselves. So how do we know what to pass on, you know? Mm-hmm. What are you supposed to do if a parent's just like, I can't do it? Then, you know, there, and <laughs> there, there, are par- there are parents that, that, that feel that way. Yeah. And, and that's where a lot of people are like, you know what? It should be done in the home. Well, sure. And for families that. But why? Well, That's because I, of that, uh, because of the values, I think, below it. Um, mm-hmm. I want to impose right now, sex is not viewed as sexual health. It's viewed from a moral lens, like morality rather than sexual health. And so there's a real fear of what you're going to teach my child. I don't know the values that you're going to overlay it with that don't match with my values. And the reality is, is when comprehensive sex ed is taught well you're doing it so that the kids and families bring their own values to the discussion you're teaching the sexual health piece Mm -hmm. and then letting them wrestle with values and and with comprehensive sex ed too abstinence is a part of that and if you want your kids to wait until marriage are you giving them the skills to know how to navigate the waters of how to say yes how to say no and do that we just kind of were like don't do it, and we're not going to give you any skills to navigate it. Good luck. But they tell they share the basics, right, at the public school, like what to do with your body parts and stuff. I mean, and I know help, we're not a, and help. They you teach get, you how to. They give maturation, and that's, that's yeah. okay. Yeah, well, yeah, well they right. teach you, talked, you. You mentioned this. I took this my with, son to yeah, maturation. Yeah. yeah, but all they teach you is that you're going to stink. You're going to grow hair, take a shower, wear deodorant. That's pretty much most. <laughs> and they, they don't about. like Alvernacchio. I love. I wish my kids got this kind of thing around maturation, where he's like, guess what. You're going to get to a point where your body's going to develop its own superpowers. And these are the, this is what it's going to look like and makes it super exciting mm-hmm. instead so of like, scary. dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Here's yeah. all the terrible things that are going to happen to you. Yeah. It is kind of a fear based like system. We really can change the lens. And I wish to your question of what do parents do? I wish they had access to be like, you know what? I'm really grateful there's a school or a community that's helping me pick up this piece of parenting that I'm not comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I wish they had that. And my son 
uh, he's been getting digital citizenship classes at school. So he's learning stuff from from people that know far more about digital citizenship and technology than I do. They send home a worksheet with him, like, here's everything we discussed, and here's the talking points you can build on in your home. And every time I look at this, I'm like, this could be sex, people. Like, we could be doing this where they're bridging the gap between school and home or Mm -hmm. community and home. Like, this could be... It's yeah. so doable. I tell you what, sex and finances. If sex they would incorporate and finances. those into the yes. school system, oh, Amen. we'd be so much better. I think we might have even mentioned that when you were on the podcast the first time, Kristen. Is really is is sex and money are like oh, the yeah. two things yeah. that break up a that marriage, huh? up a marriage. We need to actually take a quick break. Play a message here from our sponsors. But there's uh, we posted in our Facebook group if anybody had questions, and, and we got uh, one person with some questions. So when we come back, we'll play these uh, questions from Brittany but so so hang tight right now all right it's that time of the podcast where Chrissy and I take a few minutes of your time and tell you about our awesome sponsors these are some great local businesses that are helping keep this podcast going so when you support them you're supporting the podcast Hey, this episode of the podcast is sponsored by Mountain Standard Time Marketing. Mountain Standard Time Marketing is all about small businesses. After spending the last 15 plus years in marketing roles that helped large companies grow and expand revenue, owner Brandon Hill wanted something different and decided to lend his experience towards helping small businesses. He also wanted a way to connect and engage with the local Salt Lake City community. That's you guys. Mountain Standard Time Marketing was born shortly thereafter. MST offers full-service marketing, consulting, design to help small and growing businesses meet their marketing needs. Brandon truly feels that by leveraging strategies and tactics used to help multi-million dollar corporations thrive, Mountain Standard Time Marketing can help small businesses grow. Small businesses spend way too much time finding and managing freelancers or are faced with financial burdens and risk if they work with a full-fledged agency or hire internally. This is where you let MST, Mountain Standard Time Marketing, do the work while you work more efficiently. You're going to want to get in touch with them right away. Go to mstutah.com. Again, that's mstutah.com. Get in touch with them and also let them know uh, thank you for sponsoring I Am Salt Lake Podcast. This episode of the podcast is also sponsored by our friends at Market Source Real Estate, which I'm going to let Chrissy tell us about. Yeah, if you guys love the charm and character of older homes, you have to contact our friends Monique and Jeremy Higginson of Market Source Real Estate. They're based out of Sugar House and they've been here for 17 years, specializing in helping people buy and sell homes in the Sugar House and Greater Salt Lake area. They have a background of flipping houses and they've owned almost two dozen homes themselves. So they really know the ins and outs of older homes. If you're looking to sell your home, Market Source Real Estate specializes in helping sellers update or repair their homes so you can increase the value and help help you make more money. If you're looking to buy an old home, they know what to look for in older homes so you don't end up buying a money pit. You can find their info at thinksaltlakecity.com today or call them at 801-811-1789. Again, that number is 801-811-1789. Hey, this episode of the podcast is also sponsored by our friends at Five Wives Vodka. Hey, if you're in Texas, you're going to drink Tito's, but if you're in Salt Lake City, I better be seeing you drinking a Five Wives Vodka. They actually have three different flavors for you to try out. They have the original Five Wives Vodka. This is this is made from that Utah Mountain Spring water. It's 100% distilled corn spirit, and it's gluten-free. Spring is hidden up in beautiful Ogden Canyon. It's inaccessible by vehicle, so the water is hiked out five gallons at a time. They have another flavor, which is the delicious cinnamon, which I want Chrissy to tell us about. That one's called the Five Wives Sinful. It's a flavored vodka with a delicious cinnamon taste. And unlike other cinnamon products that give you a cinnamon candy taste, Sinful is like a morning cinnamon roll with only 76 calories per ounce. They also have the Five Wives Heavenly, which is a flavored vodka, which is kind of a tie between that one and the cinnamon one, the Five Wives Sinful. It offers a delicious vanilla taste, which is like rich, buttery vanilla flavor. It comes through without coating your taste buds with sugar, and this results in more vanilla 
and less calories. You could pick up any of their products at your local state liquor store in your neighborhood, or you can go to fivewivesvodka.com to find out more about them, find recipes, and really any information about Five Wives Vodka. Many thanks again to uh, Five Wives Vodka for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. All of the links can be found for all three of these awesome sponsors at IamSaltLake.com slash 323 for this episode. Let's get back to that conversation with Kristen B. Hodson. Thank you so much for listening. All right, so we're back. We uh, posted in our Facebook group, which we want to invite everybody to join. You can go to uh, IamSaltLake.com slash group, and it will forward you to our Facebook group. And a lot of times we'll say, hey, does anybody have any questions for who we're bringing on the podcast? We mentioned that we're going to be chatting with you. Brittany, uh, Brittany Hemingway, one of our favorite listeners, she posted, what's something you preach but don't practice? I think that's such a good question. And for a sex therapist, it's like a really, really good question. Because yeah. one of the first things when people find out that I'm I'm a woman and I'm a sex therapist, I think they automatically look to my husband of like, oh, yeah, like he is hooked up. <laughs> and the greatest myth that we just have like an out of control sex life. And that's not necessarily like by trade, I'm a sex therapist, but as a human, I'm working out this like everybody else. Mm-hmm. And I had never been a mom of, I had never been pregnant yeah. or a mom of one. And that changed my sex life. And then pregnant with two and that changes it again. And then baby number three, like we're having to constantly reinvent our sex life. So that's not necessarily a practice what I preach, but that's a thing. But with that is I often tell people to, uh, when they get into the parenting stages, to not just rely on spontaneous sex that in the parenting stages, we plan everything like carpool to play dates. We plan everything. And then whatever's left over, we do, we give to sex. And so plan your sex. Make it a priority. I wished I did that a lot more. I think more. that's – can I go there? No, let's I go. I think that's what we've discovered oh, having a been, new baby. It's been horrible. I'll admit <laughs> it. It's, <laughs> it's been rough. It's been rough. But we finally were like, we need to just be like, are we going to have sex tonight? Okay. Then we can plan on getting the baby down. We can plan on doing this, yes. can, you know, like really plan our time around it so we can enjoy it better. And I think, you know, there, there's, you were mentioning being spontaneous. And I think even if you do plan it, once you get caught up in the moment, that goes out the window. You're totally. just like, I'm, I'm, you know, okay with uh, not being spontaneous. Yeah. Well, and that's what I, I, that's the thing is once you're in it and you can relax and like, yeah. remember why you guys even got together and potentially had babies in the first place is because yeah. you first existed as a partnership. Um, but I tell people, you can be as spontaneous as you want if it's planned. And again, I wished right now with everything I, that was going on that we were a lot better at that. But sometimes we're just honestly still giving each other high fives in the hallway and being like, hopefully I'll see you by the weekend. Like, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So that's kind of that's life of life. parenthood. And, and so the, the whole thing of my sexual relationship is probably a lot like a, similar to a lot of people's um, because we're, we're having to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And my body's changing. His body's changing. Kids and just the dynamics of a relationship. Yeah. So, um, again, the belief that all sex therapists, I mean, I'm sure we have some advantages because we can talk about sex like no problem and ask that that's not a problem. But um, you can get good ideas. You can be like, oh, oh yeah. that was a good idea. I totally. like someone brought in some porn Access today to that products. Looked really interesting. <laughs> Access to all sorts of just products, kidding. which is really no, fun. True. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a one-up if you're comfortable. I think, and I know we still have, Brittany still has more questions. Yeah, she asks a few but, at a time. Oh, did she? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't see well, the other ones. Let's, um, let's get into her question. Okay, yeah. I so the next know. question is, what is the most common thing that people are afraid to share with you? Oh, the thing they're most afraid to share. I, the most common question I get is, am I normal or are we normal or is this normal? But thing, I think going to a sex therapist and know, like knowing that you're going to a sex therapist, people are really, really open. Like they're paying a, a lot of money to come see you. So I don't know. I guess I don't know because they tell me, I think they're telling me everything. But they're, they're finally to the point where they're ready to open up probably yeah. by the time they get to you. And that's kind of the art of the therapist is to create that safe environment where they can peel back and open up. Maybe 
someone that's struggling with pornography is worried that I might approach it in the same way that they've had before. And they're afraid to tell me how much they're looking at it, like really the circumstances around it. And then once they realize that I'm not monitoring how much they're masturbating or not, and I'm, I'm looking at things from a deeper and a more compassionate lens, then they open it up from that standpoint. You were mentioning normal. So her last question is, what is normal sex? Yeah. And that's the number one question is people want to know what is normal. And but I will say there's no norm. Mutual pleasure, consensual. Um, there, there's no normal. Yeah. People, if, if it's and people want to because you want to know, like, is what I'm doing and, and freaky. Yeah. Or is, our relationship, is this weird? I, yeah. And if two, if you're in a relationship, because plenty of people are practicing solo sex. Not everyone's in a partnership. Sure. So there's six principles of sexual help that I tend to walk people through and to have them start to go, oh, yeah, I'm not I could improve my sexual integrity or it is taking up more time than I'd like. But there really isn't a normal like sexuality is as unique as a snowflake. No two are alike. So you really don't get a normal. Here's a question. What if you're in a relationship where you don't really know how to communicate? with your partner, right? Where you're like, gosh, I'd love to be able to open up and talk about sex and do these things, but I don't know how. Is there any, like, do you have any advice, say for listeners or, or Mm -hmm. anything like that you would recommend to do to kind of help break some of that ice? Yes. Cause I'm sure once you start talking about it, it could be fine. Well, and the first thing I do is to view it as a skill. Like many people develop like podcasting Chris sure. you've developed this over five years and you've stuck with it and practiced and I would say now you're one of the leaders in podcasting well thank you <laughs> so but you, in our pre-conversation before this you were yeah. like a year when we first started this I didn't know and this, I didn't, yeah you don't know what to do you don't know what to even talk that's the about same with sex and if people can acknowledge the first thing of I want to start talking with with this about you but we've never talked about it I feel kind of uncomfortable I don't know how you feel Um, But that's a starting place just to acknowledge the awkwardness and that this has never been like we've never done this, but let's give it a shot. That's a starting place. Um, The other thing is if there's a history of fighting around it, again, to say, I want to talk about this because it matters and I want this to be a good part of our life. That's a very different conversation of I want to talk about our sex life because it's dry. I'm I'm furious with you. One is going to lean into, oh, you care about me and you want to like we want to I do. I also want to make this a good thing. The other is going to put me on the defense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The other thing is if people are just starting to have conversations to to make it bite sized a little bit like a skill of sometimes these conversations can turn into fights because it pulls up all this other stuff. So set the timer for 10 minutes, stay on topic and then be like, we're going to keep practicing this. That's another skill that I do it with a therapist, another thing. But honestly, the starting point is just to identify that you want to and don't do it after you've just had sex. Like, don't do it right then. Is that because you feel really happy then and everything's going to be fine? Well, like, let's say you had a great experience and Chris is like, so about that experience we just had, I didn't love it. I think in when you Would you really say that? Is that okay? I mean, that's not, you don't want to ever say that. Right. But I'm sure (laughs) some some people people do. do. Yeah, they do. Or their intentions are really good. For example, if Chrissy wanted to be touched in a different way. Right. Sure. That that how what's going on is okay, But she also feels like it could be better. Doing it right after that experience might be far more vulnerable Mm -hmm. than if you're like, do it away from the bedroom in a state where it's not vulnerable. Yeah. That can be a very different conversation of, you know what? I love how you touch me and I would love adding this a little bit more. Would you be willing to try that? So she's already telling you a positive of, I like this. And, and I'm sure if you got that information, you'd be like, well, yeah, I'll try that. Does that make sense? And, you know, it makes a lot of sense. And there's okay. some free advice for our <laughs> listeners, right? <laughs> well, I so, want to know, like, how would you, th- there's, that's like amazing advice to get talking. What if you feel like you need to go to a, like a sexual health counselor yeah how do you bring that up in a partnership without offending them or hurting their ego or their feelings i think the biggest place is to not put blame of i'm taking you to fix you like that the problem exists because of you therefore we need to go to a therapist so they can fix you so we can get back on track i think it'd be great to go to a sex therapist though oh yeah 
Well, there you go. You guys just did it. <laughs> Way to go. No, We're in. No, I mean, I think I think therapy is great in general. For yeah. some reason, it has this bad thing around it. Like it's like you're broken. I think or, it's totally. slowly getting better. It's slowly being more accepted as something that everybody should do. I just look at it as like a mentor. Like you would yeah. be a mentor. Yeah. Like somebody, like a like a coach. A well, sex coach. And this is, I don't want to say this is cliche, but we, we get service on our cars more regular than we get serviced on our relationships or we go to the dentist or the doctors and all these things that we need for our health mm-hmm. and relational and emotional and sexual health. We need tune-ups. We need servicing. We need help. Yeah. And so if we can look at it from that standpoint, for me as a therapist, I love it when people don't come in when they are one foot out the door. Mm-hmm. That's that's the hardest time when a therapist oftentimes can't they, it can be repaired. But if someone came in and they're like, you know what, we have a few things that we need help with. We can't quite figure it out. Do you ever have people come in and maybe we can't talk about people, but who who it's kind of a reason like they want to bring them to counseling just to prove there's a problem. Yeah. And they can then they can break up, you know, or they can. Like, mm-hmm. that, that would be. They can, that the therapist, it can, I don't know, well, I mean, it, it some, can, that's a great passive aggressive move. And, it, but it also justifies of we tried everything. Exactly. We tried everything. We went to therapy. It didn't work. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes therapy can seen it, be seen as the last ditch effort instead of an important piece of relational health across the whole relationship. Yeah. I know we talked about like new moms, new dads, and we're obviously in that bucket, but do you, do you ever have to work with, or how do you help a mom? who's just had a baby get back in touch with her sexuality. Yes. And do you work with the like the fathers and or wives of those Both. women? Chrissy's looking for some advice over well, here. Like how, you know, <laughs> yeah, how, do you, no. how do you help the other spouse deal with the the fact that their life they haven't gone through all that physical stuff. Right. But all of a sudden their life they just don't have sex anymore. Like Right. They have to go through right. this torture, basically. Well, and that's the thing, though. That's the cultural myth that we perpetuate mm-hmm. um, because we – so think of the six-week appointment and everyone's waiting for the doctor to give permission for the six-week appointment. Yeah. And that's because we're still defining sex as penis-to-vagina intercourse when really for a woman's pleasure, there doesn't need to be any penetration. Yeah. Really. And we have hands and we have mouths and we have non-sexual touch. Like you could be giving the most sensual, amazing scalp massage. Like people don't have to live in the desert until that six week appointment. Yeah. And so I think (laughs) redefining. Like I say, I have a mouth. And and being and just being <laughs> and being flexible though with the way that we're defining sexuality and the reality is is we need to uh, broaden our definition and develop some flexibility and play mm-hmm. because babies come into play or medical issues come into play or disabilities can come into play and so if you think about it, a lot of the ways we talk about sexuality are in a really heteronormative able bodied way that's and very there's a true. lot of ways we can talk about sex and it doesn't just have to be that. So that's one of the things we do. We also talk about chore play, which is a fun word for partnering and helping couples learn how to partner better around the home and the kind of the domestic responsibilities so that one person isn't carrying all the weight and, and they're sharing that load, which there's research that the better the partnering, the better the sex life. That makes Um, sense. It does. It does. And so there's a lot of, this is one of our most favorite, the healing group focuses on maternal and reproductive health, sexual health and couples. Like this is right in our realm. So we help both partners in their relationship and to not have the partners get competitive about their experiences, but to cultivate empathy between the two so they can talk about it instead of being like, I was up for three hours, so I'm in a worse position than you. So therefore you can't feel bad about what's going on at all. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm the only one that can feel like our circumstances are hell. If we can start to cultivate empathy and hear what's going on in the relationship, then they can start problem solving together right. and be in each other's corner and on each other's team. Like, so that's what we work for. Show them that they have the same goal. Yes. And they're not, they're not enemies. Yes. Yes. So that's a lot of what we do. That's I, speaking of that. I know I'm going off and no, no, no. You stuff, had some great questions but, here, Chrissy, that you jotted down. So I'm going to let you yeah, kind of take the rein here. What What advice would you give to women who struggle with postpartum depression? Mm-hmm. And the, and I think a lot of people ignore the family who has to try to deal with watching yeah. them go through that. Yeah. And you know how how do you how do they even know? 
So we know that, that they have it. One in seven. We know that one in seven women are going to experience pregnancy and postpartum anxiety, depression, all of that. Um, and did you know ten percent of dads will? I believe it. Yeah, I believe it. Yep. And it may be both of these numbers could be higher. It just depends on who's reporting it. And if um, the people that are reporting also are recognizing it as such. Mm -hmm. So these numbers could be higher. But one of the hardest areas, because for a lot of moms, one of their barriers for acknowledging or asking for help with postpartum depression is they can feel a little bit like they're stuck between being a good mom or having postpartum depression. So it can be tricky if someone approaches and said, hey, are you doing okay? Be like, yes, I'm doing just fine. Mm -hmm. I empathize because I experienced postpartum depression. That's why the healing group was born is because I went through postpartum depression and anxiety and OCD and actually went through it with every single pregnancy. I just learned how to, to manage it better. Honestly, to rather than go in and and attacks uh, uh, someone to say, how are you? Well, my baby's sleeping okay. And this, no, how are you doing? Yeah. How much sleep are you getting? Because if a mom isn't getting a chunk of four hours, moms need at least four hours to start to have that healthy brain that allows them to not be anxious. Oh yeah. Um, and the other thing is moms may not present as depressed in the way that we think where they're just in bed crying and can't get out. Sometimes it can present as major anger and irritation. Like I'm not depressed. I'm just mad like all the time. <laughs> yeah. And that, and so Interesting. this, this family that's going through, I would say, get educated about it, mm -hmm. get your own supports and reach out from a compassionate position, offer to like, can I hold the baby while you go shower? Can I just, instead of saying, let me know if there's anything I can do to help. That's I had women that would reach out that would say, I'm bringing you dinner at six. See you then. It yeah, wasn't like even a you question. You have no choice. I'm helping you. Or they would come over and they would um, bring me dinner. But while they were talking to me, they didn't just sit down. They were wiping my counters and like they saw that I had a load of dishes in there. Those are unspoken ways that you can help a mom that's mm -hmm. struggling with postpartum depression where you're just helping them. Yeah. I love it. That's great. That's what I, I mean. I try, to, I try to help out around the house. Oh, you you're know? incredible. I, I believe that you are. I, well, and so I'm a working mom, right? I'm a full time worker. Chris takes care of everything. Mm, so when so I come great. home, I'm just like, I'm tired. I don't want to do the dishes. And then, yeah. you know, and I'm always like, I want to help and I never really get around to it. So Chris takes care of everything. Mm -hmm. and well, I figure if I'm the one who's at home, I might as well be the one who, you know, obviously cleans up and makes some dinner and takes care of the baby. I don't know. And I think that's I mean, awesome. You know, I, it is awesome. I, there's sometimes I have so much guilt. Why do you have guilt to that? I have guilt that you go to work, though. <laughs> there you go. At least I don't we're both know guilty. if we get through parenting without guilt. I, you know, I there's think there's like parenting guilt. There's a part of that that's kind of good, right? Yeah. Because then it you're, means you're empathizing a little bit with your partner. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Like even that idea of like living life with balance. I'm like, no, I just juggle. Like I'm never in balance. I'm just juggling. There's it's that's a, a really great idea that someone wrote it's down nice in a book theory. one time. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's a nice meme to pass around. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Do you get a lot of women who come to you who are trying to overcome the shame that they're raised with about their body and sex? Absolutely. And I mean, how do you approach that with them? Um, one of the first things I do, and, and I think this is fascinating, is so Brene Brown, are you familiar with Brene Brown? She's the one that has done everything on shame. Um, yes. So yeah. she and she. I was told to read some of her books. They're amazing. I was yeah. too by designers. She they're must just so be amazing. good. And so mm -hmm. she really put shame on the map. Like, yeah. this is what shame is. This is what it looks like. This is how you develop resilience. What there wasn't was a definition of sexual shame. Until May of last year, there was not a definition of sexual shame. And so some people won't know what it is. So one of the first things I do is to read what it is. And oftentimes people will get really emotional because it finally names an experience that they've carried throughout their whole life. So even just naming it makes them be like, oh, this is like a thing. This isn't just me. I'm not just broken. Like this is a thing. Which is nice when you realize you're a human in a sea of an experience that all other humans are in. Absolutely. It's not just you going through it. Absolutely. And then helping women reconnect with their sexuality, because especially if you grew up in a religious culture um, and we can just it's not just unique to Mormonism um, a lot of patriarchal religions women aren't the ones that are there to be um, desired but don't have the desire like yes. even culturally men are the ones that are the sexual beings and women are 
So the toys. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, so, sorry, I know that's. But that's that's but sometimes, and that's gender stereotypical. But that's kind of what we do. Mm-hmm. So helping women start to claim and develop their own sexual identity beyond a relationship, like just who are you as a sexual being? What does your desire feel like? How do you want to express? And someone, women will be like, I don't have any desire, but if I can connect them to places of passion and desire in their life beyond sexuality. They can, they at least know what it feels like. And then we can start working into their own sexuality. And I always remind them that even if they're in my office, they at least have a desire to desire. What a great start to play. Like what a great place to be. Yeah. And so to not have them feel broken and that there's not an agenda for them to be fixed, but just to have a safe space to explore all of these things and body image as well. Um, yeah. So th- all of those things that I, I love doing that too. That's awesome. all of it. So if somebody wanted to come to you, I mean, are you pretty booked up? I'm pretty booked up, but that's why I have a clinic. And yeah, but I want to come to you, not like me <laughs> particularly, but like, let's say they want to come to you. Yes, oh, I, mean, I have. I, mean, I do have a weighty, I have a wait list. Okay. Um, but I, so we do, we're doing regular weekly trainings and I'm doing supervision with therapists and they're, I've got, I'm fortunate to work with what I think are some of the best therapists in the state around these issues. And and we're really the only clinic that has the level of expertise and specialization because you'll see a lot of clinics and you'll see that they specialize or they treat 30 or 20 or we specialize. We have three specialties, maternal and reproductive health, sexual health and couples. That's what we focus and train on. We don't want to be journalists. We want to be really, really good at those things. And do mo- do you take most insurances or not? Probably not. No. Fortunately, we do. Really? We just oh. got paneled on Select Health, which is amazing. Oh, that was great. a seven-year battle. And so we're paneled with Select Health. We're paneled with Blue Cross Blue Shield, University of Utah, EMI. We take Bishop Pay, all sorts of payment options. We also have an intern clinic. Awesome. Well, there you go, Chrissy, there. (laughs) And the other thing we're starting to do is the development of our online courses to make our material accessible for people that may or may not want to come into therapy, but they want the education and they want the courses. So we're actively developing that. I also want to touch Rocky Mountain, was it Rocky Mountain Sex Summit? Yeah. When we had you on before, it was like the first year of it. You're still doing it, Well, so the summit was only born two years ago. Oh, two years. For some reason, I there, thought it there was, was a, uh, you were doing some event. Some event. Was I doing ago. the blue? So there, there's been a variety of events. I, I wonder if it remember. was the blue boutique. I, might, you, I don't it, know. It might have been. Maybe. 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 It sounded fun. I yeah. listened to it and I was like, I wish I knew oh, about this. Oh, I wonder if it was ago. on the edge of the bed. Maybe. 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 At the Hotel Monaco. That's what it was. Monaco. That's what maybe it was. that's what yep. it was. Maybe that's what it was. So this was gear. The Rocky Mountain Sex Summit is my, the, you don't, anyone can say that they're a sex therapist in the state of Utah. Anybody. If they've been to a weekend workshop. They can say they're a sex therapist. And, then and come and work at your clinic. Your- nah, no, because at my <laughs> clinic, it's going to be like, here's the requirements to be a sex therapist at my clinic. Um, but what most people, most consume, like people that are looking for therapy don't know that. And most therapists that are going to graduate school have never had a class in human sexuality ever. Really? So the Rocky Mountain Sex Summit is to help therapists develop competency around sexuality because every single person whether their specialization like you don't have to be a sex therapist everyone that walks into your office is going to be a sexual being with a sexual story so every single therapist needs to have a base level competency in sexuality so the rocky mountain sex summit is to help raise the professional competency around sexual health because then we help everyone in the community everybody wins if all of these therapists are improving the competency there And right now the schools aren't doing it. Mm -hmm. And Utah and the Rocky Mountain region, like when I got certified as a sex therapist, I'm having to fly all over the country. It cost me the same as a master's degree, a second one. And I was like, no, we're going to make it accessible here. And we're going to put Utah on the map for being one of the leading places for training sex therapists. When is the Rocky Mountain sex? We do it every fall. Every fall. So Um, it's not until the fall time. Not until the fall. Um, And we do have people in the community. We have all sorts of health providers come. It's not just for therapists. We have educators and um, OBs and midwives and pediatricians and everybody can come, but we're doing something in the spring. That's more of a closed event. That's just, uh, we're bringing a man named Doug Brown Harvey, who does the other kind of approach to sex addiction, which is the out of control sexual behavior to get clinicians trained in that. So people have options when they're feeling out of control with their sex or porn or that they don't have to just go to the addiction path. They can go this other way as well. Do you feel like your 
your presence has been well received by the rest of the community? Like I think people so. are really coming to learn and, and trying to grow with you. Other I therapists, do. I do. I feel like by being willing to be vocal, other people have stepped in, and there there's some amazing voices in this community. Like I am definitely among many many professionals that are wanting to, and organizations that are wanting to make Utah a much healthier place regarding sexuality so that's exciting yeah um but i feel like i feel like there's a an advocacy and a responsibility piece because i do a lot of media that it gives people like oh i can do that if she can do it i can do it and that's Mm -hmm. exciting you're helping everyone else find their voice yes and i love i love people to find their voice Mm because it's not everyone everyone's going to resonate with different voices couple questions as we kind of wrap things up to kind of uh, shift gears. I don't think we had the Salt Lake City questions when you were on the first time. Uh, A couple of questions we like to ask. If somebody was visiting Salt Lake City for the weekend, is there something that you would recommend or tell them to check out or to do? I know it's kind of a vague question, but I've had, you know, areas of town, hiking. Yeah, Uh, I would say to get into those mountains. Yeah. Um, to get into the mountains or get to Southern Utah with the slot canyons and to go see all of those amazing places. But for me, it's, it's the outdoors. It's also the concerts yeah. and the food. I think I was reading at one point people being like, ah, Utah's not a, it was on your, uh-huh. your posts on your Facebook page of Utah's not a foodie place. I'm like, yes, it is. We've what? got amazing yeah, restaurants. Is, Plus, what I was going to ask you with some of your favorite local eating spots. That, oh. That's another question I always ask here. So, One I mean, of, we have great food here. And, it, when, and, you know, I remember you asking me these questions last did, time. Okay, so maybe I did. And I maybe blanked. I did. Well, I was like, I love the local music scene. And you're like, well, what do you like? And I just went blank. Oh, yes, yes, yes. H- I, so I really love HSL. Have you ever been to HSL? We still have not been We there. need to go, but. I love HSL. I yeah. love Finca. Those would be like top two that I love. I love flatbread because that's just fun dining. That's in Sugar House. One of my favorite restaurant closed, Forage. Did you ever go to Forage? Did we go there? We've heard about Forage. I we, loved Forage. I, wasn't it the same people that opened HSL or am I way off base? Different. Okay. okay. But have you I been to the Rose reason Establishment? Reason they were yeah, the Rose Establishment. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the place. Rose Establishment. Yeah, 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 by the gateway down there. Yep. Great. So those I used are some to live of my right favorites. Around the corner Did from you? There too oh, at one time. that'd be a problem for me. They're rose lattes, <laughs> dreamy. So <laughs> you know, I always ask that. And now that I do, you know, I ask you. But hey, five years has changed. I'm sure you yeah. have new favorite places. You're allowed to grow in five years and find new things. I hope I do. Where, yeah. where do you see yourself in five years? Speaking of five years, where do you see yourself with all this? Where do, Where would you like to go with all of this, Kristen? Honestly, that that Utah is one of the go to places, one of the hubs for sexual health. That. We have some of the best training. We have some of the most solid therapists that we've got um, people that are speaking out that we have comprehensive sex ed, whether it's through the schools or other organizations that are developing it, but that people start to, and honestly, that pornography is not like the leading topic around sexual health in Utah. (laughs) That Mm -hmm. would be amazing. That'd be great. It'd be great. So in five years, those would be the things I hope is that if, if honestly, if there was one thing, it would be to change comp sex ed. And to make that accessible for everybody that you don't have to have, you don't have to opt in, but if you want to, you have it. It's available. It's available. How can people get a hold of you? What's the best way? Um, so my, I've got my Instagram, which is just Kristen B. Hodson. I've got my Facebook, which is Kristen B. Hodson. Or you can go to the Healing Group. We're launching our new website in about four weeks, which will be exciting. I love the new look. Um, that's how. And I'll put all those links at IamSaltLake.com with this episode Anything you want to ask uh, Christy or anything that we didn't bring up, Kristen, that you want to make sure we talk about before I completely let you go? I feel like you guys hit it. I loved everything we talked about. Excellent. Yeah. I didn't know if there's something you wanted to promote or in, cause I know you do classes and events and I do and things like that, that, that people, the public can come and join, right? If, well, the biggest one I do right now is yes, you can talk to your kids about sex and to empower parents on how to navigate these waters. And we get to the principles of, of it rather than just the specific circumstances, which we get to in later classes. But watch for that. I'm always advertising kind of what I'm doing on my Facebook or Instagram, and it's always changing. So if you follow me there, you'll stay on the loop of what you have access to. Awesome. Anything you want to ask, Chrissy? Give me a piece of advice for our listeners. (laughs) That is such a big question. That's a big question, Chrissy. It better be really deep. Wow. Okay. Really deep. What is it? Just a life piece of advice. Okay. This is what I'm going to say. And this isn't necessarily related to sexuality. And that's but okay. The biggest, 
and when people say what's the book that's influenced you the most and it actually influenced my parenting as well is a book called Grit um, by Kel- is it Kelly Duckworth last name's Duckworth anyway the principle of grit that it's not necessarily the most talented or the smartest people in the room it's the grittiest people in the room that make things happen in their life that they stick with it and they go and they go and they go and so the principle of grit even as it relates to sexuality that people don't they shouldn't feel like they should know how to do this no none of us got mm-hmm. taught stick with it keep practicing view it as a skill like anything else in your life and you're good awesome it's awesome great place to end the show thank you so much for coming back on thank you for having it's me it was so fun to see you both to, to, to have you, you on the podcast and uh Maybe we'll have you back on for a third time. Fantastic. I love it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Many thanks again to Kristen B. Hodson for coming on this episode. All of the links to connect with her and to listen to episode 95. Go back and listen to episode 95. Because, I mean, again, like I said, this podcast has come so far. Yeah. And it's really fun to see how she's traveled, how she's come. Oh, from she's back grown then, so and much. You've grown I mean, it. her business, the healing group has come yeah. so far. Yeah. All of that, just type in IamSaltLake.com slash 323 for episode 323. Type that in your browser. It's going to take you right to the website where you can, uh, hey, you can share that link too with yeah. your family and friends Absolutely. on social media. And we recently got a new review on our Facebook page. Yeah, we did. We love them. If you want to leave a review, just type in IamSaltLake.com slash Facebook. That's going to take you to our Facebook page where you can leave a review. And, and what's cool about these reviews is it it lets all your friends know how you feel about the podcast. Plus, it gives us some insight on what our listeners, how our listeners feel about the podcast. I'm just pulling up that review here. It's from, it, uh, where does that go now? Casey, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce, Fralic? Uh, sorry, Casey, if I'm pronouncing it wrong. She gave us five stars. She says, as an SLC enthusiast, the I Am Salt Lake podcast is one of my favorite things to listen to at work. There's such a great variety of guests and always learn something new. I love that each guest is ask, asked about their best SLC food and recreation recommendations. You know what's funny about that, Christy, is that uh-huh. started, and I think I've said this in podcasts, that just started kind of as a silly question, and it's turned into a lot of people's favorite questions is when I ask, what's your favorite local eating places? Well, it's so great because we always want to keep exploring and learning new things, and it's such a great way to, to do it. And so often people will mention a place and I'll be like, wait a minute, I've never heard of that place. (laughs) Yeah, I know. It's great. You learn about all the little gems. Hey, it's the first of the month. That means we need to give some love to our Patreon supporters. These are the awesome uh, cowboys. These are like our backbone. These are the people that are like, hey, we love that podcast of yours, Chris and Chrissy. We want to support you. We want to kick on over a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, ten dollars. Uh, and, and become a Patreon supporter. It's like an ongoing Kickstarter, and it helps in so many ways. You guys have no idea. So many thanks to these guys. I'm going to run down this list really quick. I, w- I do want to apologize if I butcher anybody's names. Uh, anyway, let's start here. Uh, John Miller, Ryan Prince, Nicole Davison, Alex Santi, Riley Padilla, Zach Shutt, Brandon Hill from Mountain Standard Time Marketing, which he's turned into a sponsor as well. Brandon, you crazy guy. Uh, Will Dugdale, uh, Jared Aguilar, Brittany Hemingway, Jeff Hadfield, Michael Beck, Eric Tamaro, Jeff Hatt, John and Nikki from over in New Zealand, Three Irons SLC, and then Alan Martindale, Sana. Dirt in Your Skirt podcast, Christopher Heiser, Jay Chambers. That's a heck of a group. That's like an army. These right? are like the people that are behind the front line of supporting this podcast. I am saltlake.com slash donate, I believe, or support. I'll put that link in the show notes. If you just type in Patreon, uh, if you type in patreon.com and then slash I am Salt Lake or something like that, I'll take you to our Patreon page. I think there's a banner up top on the website. Yeah, easy peasy. Uh, IamSaltLake.com. Click on the Patreon banner. And uh, support the podcast. Or you can make a one-time donation as well, right from the the PayPal uh, button. 
That's going to do it for this episode of the podcast. Many thanks again to our awesome sponsors of the podcast. Seriously, go support these guys because they are helping keep this podcast going as well. Many thanks to Five Wives Vodka. Pick it up at the uh, local state liquor store, Mountain Standard Time Marketing, and Market Source Real Estate. All the links to check them out are going to be at imsaltlakes.com slash 323 with this episode. Don't forget to uh, subscribe to this podcast in your favorite podcast player. We are also on Spotify, and uh, we'll see you on the next episode. You guys enjoy your week. Good night, Grammy.